So good morning to Professor Reingold, Professor Tal, and Professor Manohar. For some time, I was thinking Professor Manohar is in India, but right now he's in Seattle. So uh, it's early morning there. Um, uh, I was very feel very apologetic that Professor Reingold has to miss his breakfast, but uh, we sincerely uh, appreciate you taking the time off uh, for attending this event. So my name is Chiranjeev. I'm currently the chair of CSA department. Uh, it's my pleasure also to welcome uh, the other uh, attendees who are from uh, mostly from India. Uh, good evening to all of you. So this uh, panel discussion is part of an event called Women in Computing. This is a series um, planned uh, by Professor Bhavna and Professor Chaya as part of our Golden Jubilee celebrations. The department is strongly committed to gender, in, uh, gender equality and since its inception have produced many eminent women scientists. But we are acutely aware that you have to raise our, uh, so raise, uh, we have to take more proactive steps to increase uh, the number of women uh, candidates, faculty, students, et cetera. So now this series is very carefully thought about and has and aims to celebrate research done by women scientists, initiate conversations about diversity and create ecosystem to encourage and support academic and professional opportunities for women in computing, especially uh, in India. Now, as you can see, this line was given to me by, our, my, by my colleague Chaya, uh, which actually captures the sentiment. Uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Professor Bhavan and Professor Chaya to take this discussion forward. Look forward to all the panelists' views. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chiru. Uh, welcome, everybody. I would like to begin by uh, briefly introducing our panelists today. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, so we have with us today uh, Manohar Swaminathan, who is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research India, where he's part of the Technologies for Emerging Markets group. He's a founding co-convener of the Center for Accessibility in the Global South at IIIT Bangalore. Manohar is an academic turned technology entrepreneur turned researcher with a driving passion to build and deploy technology for positive social impact. He has a PhD in computer science from Brown University, was a professor at Indian Institute of Science, and has co-founded, managed, advised, and angel-funded several technology startups in India. His current research focus combines this background in technology with his interest in accessibility in the global south. Thank you for being with us today, Manohar. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Tal Rabin who is a professor of computer science at University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining the university, Tal was the head of the research group at Algorand Foundation. And prior to that, she was at IBM Research for 23 years at, as a distinguished research staff member and manager of the cryptographic research team. Rabin is an ACM fellow, IACR fellow, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was awarded the RSA Award for Excellence in Mathematics 2019 and was named by Forbes as one of the top 50 women in tech in the world 2018. In 2014, she won the Anita Borg Women of Vision Award for innovation. She has initiated and organizes the Women in Theory Workshop, a biennial event for graduate students in theory of computer science. Welcome, Tal. Thank you for having me. Uh, we have Omar Reingold, who is the Rajiv Motwani Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University and the Director of the Simons Collaboration on the Theory of Algorithmic Fairness. His past positions include Samsung Research America, the Wiseman Institute of Science, Microsoft Research, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and at and Labs. His research is in the foundations of computer science and most notably in computational complexity, cryptography, and the societal impact of computation. He is an ACM fellow and a Simons investigator. Among his distinctions are the 2005 Grace Murray Hopper Award and the 2009 Goodell Prize. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Omar. Thank you. We are also expecting Professor Hema Murthy. Hopefully she will join us soon. Uh, but let's begin. And I would like to begin this discussion by looking at some statistics. Uh, here in computer science department at IASC, the percentage of female faculty barely touches double digits. The situation is similar at other IITs, which are the top tier universities in India. The most gender diverse top tier university is IIT Bombay with 16% female faculty. A rough back of the envelope calculation by simply looking at faculty profiles in department web pages shows that the number is similar globally, about 13% at CMU, 15% at Stanford, 18% at MIT, 21% at Cornell. And Caltech is an interesting inflection point. While it has 14% female faculty currently, it's expecting to add new female faculty, bringing the percentage up to 42%. 
So I want to begin by asking this. Is it important to work towards increasing representation of women in computing? And what do you think and why? I would like to hear from all of you on this. Uh, if I may begin with you, Tal. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for organizing this event. I think it's a wonderful thing and that hopefully does um, create awareness um, to the importance of diversity. Uh, why? Why diversity? It's an excellent question. Why can't we have all men, all white men here in the USA or all Indian men in India doing the work? So diversity, of course, brings different opinions on on various issues, and that's important. But you might say, a proof is a proof. Um, a protocol that does something, it just does whatever it does, and we don't do any different if it's a man or a woman. But that is not true. Um, people have different ways of looking at things. Even a set of men is diversified in their opinions of how to do the research, what questions are interesting, how to approach them, and so on. And women, because we are different, we are as capable, but we're different. We bring a different viewpoint to the discussion. Our, our proofs look different. The emphasis in a protocol is different. What is important to proof we think might be different. And because of that, I think that a field is richer, the more opinions that it has, the more approaches that it provides and so on. And by diversifying the people, we get a bigger diversity of all these approaches because the more people are similar, they think similarly. So the different we are, the better our field is. Right, so you're saying diver uh, diversity is not simply for fairness or equality, it's also better for science. Uh, Omar, what, what's your take on this? Excuse me, I didn't hear you were asking me. Uh, Omar. Omar. Oh. Uh, well, Tal said it beautifully, and, and I, I can only agree. You know, in this pandemic, at some point, there was a claim that uh, that countries that are led by women are doing better, which I don't know if, if it's true or not. <clears throat> I'm <clears throat> very willing to buy it. Uh, it's consistent with a lot of my interactions <laughs> with men and with women. Um, but I think, I mean... Uh, you can you can see the women that are in in I mean uh, there are too few, but the ones that are inside are evidence why we need them. We, we need Tal Rabin, we need Chavi Goldwasser, we need uh, Eva Tardosh, we need uh, Cynthia Dwork. We need I mean imagine our field without all of these achievements. And I completely agree with the Tal that it's not uh, yeah, the, the proofs are proofs the the theorems are theorems. But what do we study, and and what are the questions that we are interested? In? And beyond that, what is the way uh, kind of the, the spirit of a, of a field? For example, in in the theory of computing, I feel that it is a field that is pretty friendly and nice, and I think that this is affecting our success. So the the inter the quality of interactions, all of it depends on the people that are involved, and uh, and. Um, yeah, I, for one, uh, uh, feel that uh, that women have been contributing a lot, and and if we had more, we would have done uh, better. Thanks, Omar. Uh, Manoha, do you want to add anything to this? Uh, Manoha, you're muted. Uh, so I also want to add a personal note of uh, thanks and remembering remembrance and honor to Professor Preeti Shankar. Uh, Omar and Tal, Priti Shankar was a faculty when I was a student, a master's student at IAC. Uh, she taught uh, foundations of uh, computational theory, right? Uh, this is called uh, automata and uh, computation. And she later became my colleague and she was the only woman faculty in computer science department for nearly 30 years. And she had to put up with a lot of uh, patriarchy and discrimination, but you talk to her, she has such a gentle soul that as a student, I learned a lot and I wish there were many more faculty women at that time when I was a young student. And as a faculty, she always provided this gentle touch to faculty meetings, looking at questions about diversity, inclusion. You know, you, know, you look at 20 faculty and one woman faculty for 30 years 
uh, one or two in the entire division of engineering. And it's a lonely battle. And you would know that if there were more women, it would have been better for all the students and the faculty at that time. So personally, it's a very strong personal experience that is extremely important. And technically, when I came back as a faculty, she was such a welcoming colleague and a lifelong friend. And fortunately, she passed away very much early. So that, that is my personal uh, take on why we need uh, women. Okay. Bring in diversity and our commitment to teaching was what also, you know, one of the reasons I took up a career as a professor to start with is this love for teaching and how I can influence a bunch of students with my ideas about computing. And so she was a role model. So I, I'm delighted Good. to have the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, Preeti. Very thanks, kind of. thanks, Manohar. Yeah. Um, so, okay, we have, we have heard compelling reasons to suggest that we should work towards increasing representation. So I now want to talk about some hurdles perceived or real and potential actions that we can take mm -hmm. towards this. Uh, women, especially students who are starting out, often have to face being judged by different standards. And I want to give two instances of this. Uh, one, speaking their minds. Women that have strong opinions or express them strongly tend to be judged by a different standard than men and often are tagged as being aggressive. And the second is about asking questions. Again, students, women students who are starting out tend to be conscious of confirming an existing bias about not belonging if they ask silly questions and tend to miss out on this opportunity. So what do you think about this and what can be done to not feel the pressure of being judged, uh, Tal? <laughs> um, it's an excellent point. I mean, uh, I think that definitely from the two things that you described, I definitely suffer from the first. I think that I'm, uh, I have opinions, I push things forward. And I would say that definitely I would be considered more aggressive than a guy who does exactly the same thing. Luckily, having these properties also comes with a little bit of a thicker skin. So maybe you can survive the criticism a little better. But of course it shouldn't exist. There's no reason why I should be considered aggressive which is not deemed to be a positive um, uh, property. And the guy next to me is just doing an excellent job. I think that um, this is, these are things that time will take care of. It's not something that you can force anybody to feel differently. The presence of more women, of course, would help because we would not perceive each other this way, but it, it's a journey. This is gonna be something that's gonna improve over time. The second issue that you say that women don't ask questions, that is really unfortunate. And that one is on us. We should ask questions. It, it, the guys are also asking silly questions. The truth is I don't think that there are silly questions. I think that what you don't understand is not silly and you should ask, but I'm saying, here, this is something that we need to work on ourselves mm -hmm. and actively think, I want to know, I want to understand. And again, yet somewhat think, okay, so they'll think it's a silly question. What can I do? Okay, but we will, it, it, you'll be better for it. And that's just an advantage. But as I said, I think that these two things are, are difficult things. Um, and um, we have to struggle through them. I don't have any good answers of how to improve it. Right. Uh, following up on this, um, how can one, not just as an individual, but as a community, uh, avoid being judgmental and be conscious of uh, biases? You're asking me? Uh, Omar and Manohar. I wanted to say before Tal, Tal already said it, that my contribution, my personal contribution is to ask lots of silly questions as a, an older white uh, guy <laughs> to normalize asking silly questions. Uh, I think one thing to pay attention to is if your view of an individual are consistent with the stereotype of the group this individual comes from. For example, if you see a woman as being uh, too aggressive, then 
this is a warning, uh, uh, like kind of try to ask yourself, is it, uh, is it because she, she comes from a group or this individual comes from a group or because this is the, indiv is it the individual or the group? So is it the stereotype? So kind of questioning our own uh, views when they are too consistent with some stereotypes is, is perhaps a good uh, step. But I also want to, uh, to, sh to, to agree with Tal that uh, everybody asks uh, silly questions and, and right. you should be aware that uh, um, everybody's afraid. I mean, here, right. sitting here, I'm, I'm afraid of uh, saying something silly, uh, saying right. something that is not uh, phrased correctly. This English is not my first language. I may say something that I want to go out in one way or, or will go out in a, a different way. Or perhaps right. I'll, uh, you'll have a question and have nothing uh, reasonable to answer and I'll, I'll feel stressed of that. We, we should acknowledge all as a group uh, the, um, the challenges that we face as individuals rather than just as scientists or with some kind of uh, uh, image of, of kind of pure scientists that only care about uh, truth. Right. Thanks, Omar. Manohar, do you want to add anything to this? Just that, as Tal mentioned, all of these will go away as the number of women in all area, I mean, all ranks increase. And right. that's a chicken and egg problem. But I think we should rather look at how to increase rather than worry about the incidental problems that happen today. Exactly. So, so I want to get to that. So I want to steer mm -hmm. the conversation towards steps that can be uh, taken. And that brings me to the following question. Um, here at IISC, we have an excellent pool of female students, and most of them continue to academia. Uh, however, less than 20% of our PhD students are women, and like we saw the statistics in the beginning, this might be reflective of the gender situation, the global situation. Uh, and there are contributing factors that are perhaps beyond the scope of this discussion, right, like societal outreach, family situation, etc., that takes time to change. However, uh, us in education as a department, do you think there is a need to change the way we tap talent and recognize potential? In particular, is there a difference in the demonstrable strengths of men and women and what strengths we choose to test? Manohar? Yeah, I think um, it's not about, uh, so it's a bigger problem. So let me just step back and look at uh, JEE, which is a curse in India, which essentially uh, destroys uh, generations of children in their uh, pursuit of you know, top rank in JEE. And what has worsened the situation is the presence of this huge coaching industry. Uh, unicorns are coming up just targeting this exam. Uh, the exam means nothing about understanding, but it essentially means children are spending from grade 9 to 12 just looking at this one exam. So, and sorry, Manohar, coaching... for the benefit of Tal and Omar, JE is the entrance exam for Indian Institute of Technology, the IITs. Yeah, it's please go It's hard to be in this area without knowing that. That's true. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so the expansion of that is it's not just for the IITs. What has happened is JE has been uh, co-opted by every engineering institution that says, if you have JE rank, I will take you. If you have J So everybody, there are 1 million uh, people, every, children take every year. And they spent three years preparing for it in brutal concentration camps. Sorry to use that term, uh, but really you destroy their childhood. And what happens is in this pipeline, smarter girls and their smarter parents don't put their children through that grill. They say, forget JE, get out, do something more interesting and human. And you find outside this core engineering, excellent, talented women doing very, very well uh, in all other fields except engineering because you've put this you know masochistic stuff as your entry point so that illness has caught on the graduate admission so in institute of science and all graduate programs in the country there's another exam called gate graduate aptitude test of engineering the industry has caught, captured that as well so unless you pay some money spend two years doing nothing but the exam you don't get to the top institute like iisc or iit and so Many women just sidestep it and go elsewhere. So my suggestion to the department is if any department with autonomy should have a separate stream of admission, you can call it gifted women engineer program, which has very different entry requirements. Forget gate, forget JE. If somebody says I have a JE rank X, disqualify that person. 
I want somebody who is outside the stream who wants to do real computing, real science. Then you will find hosts of talented women coming to you. And the autonomy that we have has to be used to do this. Otherwise, we will still be looking at the same pipeline and saying which strength. No, you have cut them off in ninth standard, 10th standard. They are not going to come to you. And this has to be one major change. Second, I let it a matter complete. of time. Okay. I was it's just not a matter of time. It's not a matter of time. You have to take action to get out of gate and get out of JEE mindset as a department. Second, IIT Chennai has introduced humanities for undergraduates. Excellent move. Mm -hmm. uh, IIT Mumbai is trying to do it. Our engineering institutions lack this broader width in humanities, social sciences. And with the recent importance that AI has brought to bear, everybody now knows you cannot separate humanity from computing. It has to be looked together, fairness, ethics, all of that are coming in. And so a department, engineering department like computer science in the institute have to start looking at HCI. We have far too long removed the human component from computing in India. Very few exceptions exist. And HCI as a multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary uh, field will attract women from all these fields. And without these two, you stick to your traditional program, stick to your standard pipeline filtering, there's no hope of increasing the pipeline at all. There okay. will be still only exceptions and not the broad biased talent that you will miss out. That's my so stop. So sort of just two follow-up questions. Uh, so I was just going to say, isn't it a matter of time before any new test also becomes standardized and coaching institutes crop up for that new test and uh, you know, the same sort of cycle repeats, right? So how, how do we distinguish any sort of new test that we design from the standardized test we already have that I agree with you. we think is so problematic? It has to be like the um, graduate admissions uh, in uh, most uh, US schools for PhD. The, the GRE scores are you know, not counted very well. The recommendation letter, your statement of purpose. There's a lot more effort that goes into the selection process, but that is worth it. You don't go by some rank, some test, and then you'll start getting gamed. So we need to take the initiative for PhD admission as well as master's admission, if possible, to get out of the standard, not the whole thing, but at least a subset, which will bring people interested in this multidisciplinary, for which we need faculty who are in this interdisciplinary area. So we start by increasing the diversity of faculty in the humanities associated SCI fields that will bring talented women faculty in uh, and you know, it's take five years or so, but we need to start somewhere to recognize this is the fundamental problem in my right. view, of course. Right, uh, so Tal, uh, in your experience, do you think there is a need to change the way we recognize potential in US universities or even in general globally? I think that probably there's always room for change, um, not just for women, for other groups as well. Change is always good. I mean, I don't think we can use things we used 20 years ago today. But I think that um, in the US, the issue, the women do succeed in these standardized testing and have good grades and so on, but they don't choose these fields. The numbers are rising and, and what we need is to get women more interested in, in these things. And we reach them a little bit too late when we are trying to address this issue at the university level. I think that um, education and making computer science seem accessible. And um, the wonderful things that it offers has to come much earlier in the game so that um, girls are drawn to it and think that it's a potential um, as a career going forward. And I'm not just talking about academia, I'm talking about talking, I'm talking also about the, the tech industry, if you, mm -hmm go and get a, an undergrad degree in computer science, going and working in technology. I think that uh, women are really missing out on these professions because they don't see it as a career for themselves. And I think the change has to happen all around. I think that they're not drawn to computer science because there's somewhat of an image of this area that also needs to be changed. When women think about tech industry, they're not thinking that it's a place that's welcoming to them as a, a member of that community, that it's all these guys, gamers, uh, hackers that sit and code all night. And this is not something that they see themselves 
wanting to do, not because they're not capable, because this is not what they see as their lifestyle. So I think that there has to be a change in how the tech industry is also, so that it would be more welcoming to these women and to these girls earlier on. So I think that there has to be a change across the board. It's not just the admissions that's the issue. We have issues that are far more reaching than the admissions. Right. So you make this interesting point that once a tech company or even an institute gets the reputation of being an all boys club, it's, it's hard to change that. So Omar, what do you think about this? How do we, do you think, first of all, there is a need to change the way we recognize talent? And if yes, what are some concrete steps in that direction? I think uh, there is, uh, and I agree with, uh, with both of you uh, with regard to, to what you said. Um, I'll give one data point is that Stanford improved uh, the, the percentage of uh, CS students uh, from being extremely embarrassing to just being mildly embarrassing. I think we are more than a third uh, now uh, women. It's not uh, where we want to end. I don't know, perhaps we're even closer to 40%. I, I'm, I don't have the numbers just now. You mean in and the undergraduate program? In the undergraduate program. And um, one claim was that it's because we don't have a cap on uh, the number of students in uh, CS courses which the department pays dearly for in terms of the how heavy is our teaching load mm -hmm. and how large is our courses. But the claim is that, that so when is, there is too much filtering, then it will favor a man or, uh, so that's what we, that's what that the claim, and I, I believe it. Um, and I also think that as Tal said, we need things along the way uh, but I also, I mean, some of the research in, in, in fairness uh, suggests that, uh, that perhaps we do need different processes for different, uh, or to stratify the population and view uh, different parts of the population differently. Uh, so, so Manor suggested a different track. I think it makes sense and, and kind of trying to attract different uh, people. It can be as competitive, but with a, a different set of, uh, I think it's a great, it's a great idea, but um, I think what uh, uh, people don't recognize, uh, I mean, the, trying to rank everybody and then and taking the top K, uh, it just doesn't make sense because it's not, with any method that we have, we cannot really get a clear ranking and there is no clear ranking. It, you cannot say that this person is clearly better than that person. Perhaps there are groups and there are these chunks and within these chunks, I think that taking a diversity into account uh, makes a, a lot of sense. And it will take into account the difficulties that have existed before. Uh, so I think that there is room to believe that in any stage, so, uh, undergrad and, and then masters and PhDs and faculty, the women that are still in the pool have had to distinguish themselves much more. And therefore, uh, we don't need the same percentage. They already went through a lot of the filtering that we, we are doing. And I mean, the women that are, do get to, at least in the field that I know, mm -hmm. are amazing. And so I think that there is some room to, to expect that this filtering has really allowed mostly the extremely talented, amazingly talented people in. So perhaps we should take this into account in uh, accepting. Thanks, Omar. Um, can I, I, can I add something on this? Sure, please, yeah. So the feared word is always affirmative action, sort of to give women more um, than what they deserve. Because if you had that pure ranking that fell from the sky and you put the line and then, then you'd say, okay, I'll take this woman from uh, below. Um, I'm a big believer in affirmative action. Um, the reason is sort of, Building exactly on what Omer said, I think that women, in order um, to, to be perceived as good as another guy, have to actually be much better because the bias is sort of pushing them down and making them look equal. And also, I think that 
affirmative action is good because it will increase, um, we're sort of the desert generation. We're walking 40 years in the, de in the desert to get to a better place. And uh, I think that the more women that there will be in the field, other women will feel that it's more natural to keep on going and the numbers will rise um, uh, uh, naturally. So I think that this affirmative action is just something good. And by the way, I say it because I don't want to get into an argument with people who say, oh, why, why? But the truth is, I think that we're just leveling the playing field because in fact, the women are getting, um, are perceived as lower. So when you take a lower woman, she's really on par with, um, with another um, guy. And um, I want to say, Affirmative action is a two-edged sword. It's not that it's a, a great solution and, and why don't people see it? When you apply affirmative action, of course, there are always going to be the people who say, this woman got it just because she's a woman. And the truth is that people are saying it anyways, whether there's affirmative action or not. So we might also get the benefit of affirmative action. Right. Thanks, Tal. So I, I don't want to get into uh, more detail about the kind of actions we can take. But before that, I would like to talk about the role of men in the current discussion. Uh, we have Omar here, who has been an advocate of women in the field of theoretical computer science. For instance, Omar was very vocal on his blog about having a code of conduct in um, in theory conferences. We have Manohar for whom inclusion is at the core of his research. So I want to ask, how can men be more involved in this conversation? Uh, Omar, if I can start with you. Yes, yeah, so, um, so I think that uh, first realizing that, uh, that the women uh, in our field need our help. So we can't, I mean, Tal is doing amazing work on, on inclusion, but we want her also to do research. If that's the only thing that she'll do, uh, advocate for women, then uh, we lose uh, the point of having Tal in the field, which is for her to make her contributions. So realizing that we can't drop this responsibility on the injured sub-community is, is one thing. Uh, on the other end, we need to also not uh, take charge and so, so letting the women uh, lead and us following is, is a good thing and doing a lot of the footwork. Another thing is I think that uh, realizing that small actions could make a big difference. So if all the men in the field say, okay, what, what, what did they do this month for uh, diversity? What is the one hour this month I spent on diversity? This would be a huge uh, impact. And the th third thing I'm, I'm thinking of is that uh, taking a little bit of risk. So yeah, we may not get it right. And perhaps this is where we need uh, women to be forgiving. So teach us, we, we make mistakes, teach us, explain why our views are not, uh, are not uh, uh, capturing reality. Uh, but we should also be braver and say, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a charged uh, topic in general diversity, uh, gender diversity, uh, uh, racial diversity. These are all charged topics and you can always make mistakes and, and, and phrase your way, uh, your opinions uh, in a way that gets you into some trouble, but try to be brave and, and take, the, take, the, take the risk. Right, thanks Omar. Uh, so, so you talked about um, taking risks, being brave. So on this note, I want to ask, uh, do you think that men are concerned about being misconstrued? Do they feel the need to be cautious or politically correct in what they say in this context, um, Manohar? Yeah, my experience uh, with diversity and inclusion is fairly limited. So last few years, maybe four or so, I've been looking at accessibility. And in this context, uh, Microsoft Research has a diversity and inclusion committee, which is just a volunteer group within the company, looking at all aspects of diversity. And um, one of the things that I uh, want to point out is as a 
what we can do actually, what I have been trying to do is use the autonomy that is available to hire people, uh, to hire people who are not represented. So I have hired um, women who are not BTEC in top CS uh, IIT, but very creative, very good people. And I've never had a minute of regret. And so I go outside the normal stream and I uh, each, used to boast that I've never hired a IITCS person in my last five years ever. And I think it's a credit to me because I'm not taking the well-known checkbox and saying this person is going to do good work for me. So I am taking that risk because I have the luxury, my master gives me the luxury to explore and I'm using that to hire people. So I've uh, had um, a woman who is blind from birth, but she managed with, among all odds to get a master's at IIIT Bangalore. Initially, as a student, I was guiding her project. Then I hired as an intern. Then I hired her as a research fellow. And she's, uh, she's done fantastically. I've learned so much working with her. That's, I think, the important thing, that when you have diversity in the group that you work, you learn the maximum. Uh, yeah. And at some point, I say, I don't know if you're learning anything, but I'm so glad you're working for me because I've learned so much. So I, I believe that's the immediate action I could take. But I also want to look at uh, intersections, I think those are very important. Women is one, when a country like India, there's so many other factors that limit people, uh, caste, class, um, background, language, mother tongue, access to English. These are so many things which immediately people say, oh, this person cannot even say one line in English, go away. Um, and uh, I, you don't know anything if you cannot speak one line of good English, ignoring the history of where they come from. So I believe we, we should go beyond just women, but women with multiple other uh, communities that are disadvantaged sure. to the best, you know. Sure. Uh, and within each of us in all these top academic institutions and other institutions where senior men who have the autonomy and authority to do this bypassing of the traditional role, take risks, mm -hmm. go beyond the normal way of recruiting people. And you, you, I, my personal experience is nobody will regret it. And as that happens, so when in MSR, women with vision impairment joined, that was the first person who, with vision impairment in the whole lab. So the entire lab learned how to deal with this different person and everybody gained. Right. So perspectives across these marginalized communities are so valuable to the general community that as and when you see examples of it, there's no need to lecture about you should do this. It, you will, everybody will figure out, oh, I should be doing it because this is the best thing to do for me personally. It's not about society doing welfare. It's good for me. So people will do it. Right. Uh, thanks, Manohar. Uh, Tal, going back to what Omar was saying about this being a charged topic, do you think that uh, men are concerned about uh, their words being misconstrued? What do you think we can do to have more men be involved in this conversation? Tell me we can't hear uh, you. Tell, I think, you're probably yeah, muted. I, I don't know not, what to say. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what to say about the society in India. I think in the US, we're in a time where people are concerned about what they say, not just on, on the gender divide, on the racial divide, and so on. Things are charged, things are difficult. But I think that what Omar is doing is amazing. I mean, Omar is so brave. He comes to the workshop that I organized with Lisa and Shubangi, and he's one guy yeah. amongst 80 women, yeah. and he's willing to do it and take it. So I think, first of all, we all don't know exactly what to do, what is going to help, but we just need to try. And every guy who tries something, like Omar coming and doing what he does at the workshop, which is amazing, is, an, is something. And it contributes. Maybe we don't know what yet. Even the whole workshop, the Women in Theory workshop, I don't know what its contribution is. I think it is having contribution. Women say that it impacts how they feel, how they think, and so on. Great. But we have to try many, many things. And I think that the barrier really is not people being concerned that they would actually say something that would go wrong. And because of that, they don't do. I think just are, don't want to do. Men and women alike, I think getting people to do is the more problematic thing than fearing what you have to say. And about fearing what you have to say, 
you always have to be careful. No matter who you are, if you're a woman, if you're a man, you have to be careful. But we have to try and have brave men like uh, Omar. Like Omar. And it sounds like uh, Manohar as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, talking about trying. So, this subject is complicated and nuanced, and, you know, it has contributing factors that are sort of beyond. Uh, the current scope, there are social and cultural norms and culture established in the specific research community. So I want to ask, what are certain concrete things that are within our reach? Uh, what can the computing community do concretely to be more inclusive and more welcoming? Uh, if I can start with you, Tal. Um, the truth is, uh, it's it, it's hard to say exactly what should be done. I think that a, a, as a community, we're moving in the right direction. I think um, we have programs, we've acknowledged that there is an issue that has to be addressed. Stanford creating the rising stars, um, Bhavna with others have done things in stock. We're doing these things and I think that um, this brings to the attention of people who are unaware that I don't know how they can be unaware, but there are people who are unaware that there is an issue and needs to be dealt with. Um, I have to say, as Omer said, that I think that our community specific is nice, but of course the biases are there. I mean, even I'm biased, right? This is the whole issue about biases that we all have. Um, but I think that, um, we've acknowledged that we need to improve. So, and, and everybody trying something, doing something, maybe think about how you can, your, um, your faculty somewhere and there's a, a, a female faculty, go and collaborate with her. Uh, there are men who've never had female collaborators. That's insane. And uh, I think that a man who's collaborated with a woman their perception changes about the whole issue. I think that the guys who worked with me, we've been together for a long, long time, but I think that this interaction has changed them as well. So if, if there's somebody around you, reach out, try and do something. That's like is a little change that I think um, can be a big wave. Right. Thanks, Tal. Um, Omar, what do you think are some concrete things that the community, the computing community can do to be more welcoming and inclusive? I, I think that um, there's tons of things to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not concretely, I think that being ashamed is, is a good start. It's, a, it's the beginning of it. So being ashamed of the current situation. Uh, but concretely, yes, what Tal said, or even just mentoring the faculty. I mean, it's not only, I mean, there is a question of who you accept, but then what do you do for them to succeed? What kind of intervention? How do you make sure that they succeed later? Uh, every committee that you're in uh, uh, should take it into account. And, and I'm also uh, uh, very supportive of affirmative action, but affirmative action can have many forms. It can be just the notion that files from underrepresented uh, indivi from individuals from underrepresented uh, or historically underrepresented uh, communities should get a little bit more attention. They shouldn't be, that by itself already proves to be a huge thing. The moment you say, okay, let's have a few more eyes on it in, in the first, in the early stages of filtering already has a huge impact. So I think, and I think that education, again, uh, agreeing with Tal that uh, K to 12 education, what can we do about, uh, about classes not being only about uh, uh, learning Java or, or learning some, what about all the other sides uh, like HCI like uh, uh, like theory, theory is very mathematical. I think that women are by now uh, uh, at the front of, of mathematics and, and they're not afraid of uh, mathematics as much as they are of engineering. And there is so many 
beautiful mathematical aspect of uh, of CS. So I think that choose the one thing that you can do and is consistent with who you are and, and what in the place that you can contribute. So it's upon every person in the community and there's there so many directions to go. Thanks, Omar. Uh, Manohar, what are your views on this? Um, so I just a bit of a digression for Omar and Tal's uh, input that India, the situation at the undergraduate level has changed quite dramatically after the rise of the IT industry. Many women come into undergraduate programs Indeed. and seek out IT positions. And it's a matter of prestige for their families, extended families, great, great uncle saying my granddaughter is in IT. So as a society, we have changed perceptions that women want to be in IT. But my current concern is they are not proceeding beyond an undergrad or at best a master's degree. Right. They get into jobs because they don't understand the scope and the fascination and you know, opportunities in research. And that's really my concern in, from an India point of view. Uh, we have tons of women in every IT company. Interviews are almost 50-50 in terms of hires, recruits. There are no issues at the... Um, Bhavna, Chaya, please correct yeah, me. Just, just to sort of add to that for context for uh, the benefit of Thal and Omar, in India, if you go to an undergraduate class in computer science, uh, it's, it's not like there are very few women. Uh, there are enough women, except perhaps in the top tier institutes like IITs, right? The problem is after undergraduate education, even in the tech industry, there are plenty of women, I, I would say very close to 50%. Uh, in fact, computer science is not even one of those fields that women are discouraged from pursuing. Women are actively steered towards it as a consequence of being discouraged from other hardcore uh, engineering streams like mechanical and industrial engineering and so on, right? Uh, but, but the disparity sort of is evident in um, after the undergraduate level in PhD programs and after they get their PhD in pursuing a career in academia and so on. Uh, so, yeah, so I, so I would expect the, the, the problem being different, the sort of interventions would also have to be different. Um, yeah, so Manohar, you were saying. Yeah, so my suggestion is uh, maybe just like you have um, undergraduate mentorship programs for faculty over the summer, faculty, especially the male faculty should be encouraged to mentor a woman researcher over the summer. Uh, so instead of looking at admitting to a full program, mentorship of women researchers uh, just like what Omar said, just paying attention to women researchers by faculty in these top institutions will encourage more and more women to take up research. And okay. a small percentage even of that who decides to continue, that's our gain. And that's okay. how incrementally we can get more and more women into research level. This is really what I'm sure you are worried about. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you and Bhavna are here and uh, the department is the richer for it. And I hope a lot more women join because you're already there. I mean, this, the initial hump is the hardest one. Once you cross it, then you, you, it will get there. That, that's the biggest challenge. Right. So uh, one of the things, sorry, Chaya, uh, I wanted to add was um, you spoke about Preeti, Professor Preeti Shankar earlier. So mm -hmm. CSA has always had, since Professor Preeti Shankar, it has always had a female faculty member because mm -hmm. there was Preeti, there was Kavita, yeah. there was uh, Shivani, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think a lot of departments find it difficult to hire the first female faculty, but if they manage to hire and retain, then it becomes easier, right? So Preeti Shankar's contribution is, you know, we cannot state it enough, essentially. Yep. 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 Yeah, please, that was just a comment. Uh, yeah, so we are sort of running out of time. So I want to uh, ask like the concluding question. So in the audience today, we have uh, students, we have the department chairperson and deans. So I want to ask in these different roles as an educator, administrator, as, as an organization, what are some specific things do you think we can do to be more welcoming? And are there any concrete interventions that have shown success in your respective institutions that you would like to share with us? Uh, Tal, if I can begin with you. Hey, so this connects to your question and also to something that Omil said. Um, I'm on the hiring committee at UPenn this year, but I'm the diversity um, uh, a person, but not because I'm diversity. I'm in charge of diversity for the hiring process. I am diversity myself, but, but what this means is that I have to go and look 
at all, exactly what Omar said, an extra look, just one more time that somebody pays attention and draws people's attention to the application. So I go at all the underrepresented minorities and I go over all the applications to make sure there are 400 applications. Not all are gonna get a serious look, but at least for all these groups to make sure that you take one more look. And I think um, that in the long run, it pays off. So actually having a person on the committee that's devoted to this topic, doesn't have to be a woman, but somebody who pays attention. Right, matter. right. Thanks, Tal. Uh, Omar? Um, so at least in the US, this is a kind of a leaky pipeline throughout. Mm -hmm. And I think that any, at any interventions at any, at any stage are important. And also just in any other topic, I mean, listening to research. So there is a lot of research uh, on, on diversity, uh, on fairness, and trying to do, I mean, we are scientists in any other uh, sense. So if we want to bring a change, let's see what kind of interventions are already proven to work and, and let's follow them. So listening to what uh, researchers can tell us and, and trying to, to get it through and even assisting, uh, assisting uh, researchers. So for example, collecting data and sharing data. So res research can be done about, uh, about this leaky pipeline. Uh, I think this this could be an important aspect. Let's let's do it the right way. Right. Uh, thanks, Omar. Uh, Manohar, if you want to add something quickly, after that we can Very open for quickly, questions. Very quickly, same thing we did with our research fellow program. Uh, three years ago, there was one woman out of twenty five research fellows. It's a very very popular program. So explicitly, we took attention and we put uh, one person in charge of getting the pipeline filled with possible candidates. And I think three years later, we are close to 25% or more of women in this very, very popular program. So just that attention is, will do a lot of good. Uh, what Tal was saying, I, she's, she's yeah, playing yeah, the exactly. role. Right? Exactly, exactly. Thanks, Manohar. Uh, I think we can take some questions. Uh, Bhavna, do you want to uh, moderate the Q&A? Um, yes, Chaya, thanks. Um... So um, actually, since we have time, I can just ask uh, the speaker to unmute, I mean, the person who asked the question to unmute. Uh, Neil Dhara, you had a question, so could you unmute? Oh, okay, cool, thanks. Uh, am I audible? Um, yes, you are. Okay, all right. So I was just wondering if you think that the uh, scene with these massive online courses um, is a right step, uh, is, is a step in the right direction in the context of inclusivity. And uh, uh, in particular in India, for instance, uh, there has been an online BSc program being launched. So I asked this in the context of when we were talking about IIT and their uh, really specialized uh, programs, which are only accessible to a chosen few, et cetera. Uh, but I think the um, it's early days, but their online BSc degree in data science seems to be seeing, um, uh, showing uh, you know, signs of success. And do you think this is a promising move in uh, the context of this discussion? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bhavna. Thanks, Neil. Um, Manohar, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I think um, it uh, is in line with my suggestion that not have uh, JEE being the single entry point, provide options to people. And online in the new pandemic times, I think it's an excellent option. Hopefully, uh, you will get a wider uh, participation in such a program. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the major concern is to drawing these people from there to research because data science is the buzzword of the day. And so most of them taking it will be to look for immediate job openings and you will lose them to uh, research and academic uh, careers. So it's a good step, but uh, may not increase the goal that we have for a graduate plus uh, academic uh, roles. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any of the other panelists wanted to make a quick comment on that? Okay. Nothing specifically. I just say that, I mean, watching what some of my colleagues are doing, it's important not only to get everybody inside, but even in, in MOOCs, trying to give support and, and 
interventions to assist uh, uh, various sub-communities to succeed in these MOOCs and then to take it uh, to the next step. Makes sense, makes sense. Uh, Tal? Oh, okay. Nothing, okay. Um, uh, there was a question from uh, Professor Govind, I think, to Manohar, but Manohar, you've already addressed that on uh, the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you, Manohar. You spoke mm -hmm. about how you leverage the autonomy that Microsoft uh, provides you to tap more talent, which uh, clearly uh, institution like IAC, we do not have because we have certain rules, we have policies which we need to follow. So we don't have too much autonomy as faculty. But let's say we had autonomy. If we had autonomy, what do you suggest? Um, one is the, uh, you know, how do I, as a faculty member, tap talent, uh, you know? Yeah, um, I um, disagree on your statement in the first place. I think ISC faculty are one of the most autonomous in the whole world. <laughs> okay. you, you don't have funding constraints. You don't have to get funding for your students directly. Every student gets paid by the government. Huge benefit. Uh, but autonomy you have, when you have funded project, you have autonomy to hire your project assistants. That's an excellent first step. Because mm -hmm. working as our project assistant at IASC is so much valued outside uh, in India that you can be very selective. Nobody's going to take you to court by saying, I'm going to only hire women RAs. Makes That's sense. it. I mean, who, you are answerable to nobody. And start with those projects. They get introduced to the research environment, what they can do. Then they get interested in a master's program, research program. If every faculty were to do this, without worrying about GATE and Government of India regulations, you will have 50 women working as research assistants. Because I know Institute has so many beautiful projects that require youngsters with hunger for work to work on it. Because our salaries are minuscule. You know, right. people come to a position there because not for the salary, they're just subsistence really. But right. I have seen over the last 30 years, a position as a research assistant in Institute of Science is so valued that right. you have a powerful weapon right there. Makes you sense. just use it. Makes sense, okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, I just noticed that our fourth panelist, uh, Professor Hema Murthy, has just joined. Uh, I'm just going to promote her to panelist, and you know she'll rejoin. Um, maybe she'll have something to say, uh, even though we're sort of at the end of the session. Um, but so, but how do you tap the talent? That's my question. Like, do you go to institutes and give talks? Do you, you know, is that a part of your agenda? What do you do? Uh, we actually go give talks uh, okay. to uh, various many institutes about the research fellow program. Mm. But the internship program is uh, more of an incestuous thing. Somebody who is working here will refer. But then you have the ability to filter and say, mm. no, I will get good talent. I don't have to get this person. I will look for this. And right. be open to uh, filtering out based on your personal uh, you know, uh, agenda of addressing a particular disadvantaged community. So, right, right. Right, right. Makes sense. So uh, Nishant has a question. Let me just, uh, I'll, uh, well, I don't one second. Let me just allow him to talk. Um, Nishant, can you unmute? I, I don't want to put him on spot. He's the one who puts my daughter to bed. So <laughs> uh, um, let me just read out his question. Um, so Nishan says, uh, Chaya, Bhavna, Tal, oh, he, he thanks us all for the panel. He says, absolutely agree with some of uh, the points about affirmative action and the take one more look point made by Tal and Manohar. How do we ensure that women uh, and more importantly, men do not get the impression that we're not hiring them based on merit? As I said, this is a problem because when you're trying to improve things, it is going to be the case. But as I said, people think that anyways, even if you're not doing anything actively, people will say that a person got hired because they were from some X category. Um, I said, this is a period we have to pass it. Right. And these opinions will change once there are women out there who are doing phenomenal work, women and underrepresented minorities who are doing phenomenal work where it's clear that it was um, based on their um, abilities and not because they're, I don't know, I have uh, another X chromosome. Um, and I, I wanna say my sister once uh, uh, told me about this very interesting uh, research that she had read in, the, in many places, there's a two-body problem. 
and institutions hire whoever they think is the star, usually the man, and they take the woman as added baggage because they want to bring the man. But she said that some research was done on these couples, and in many, many instances, the, the wife had done better than the husband eventually. Right. So, I mean, sometimes we're hired not just because of our gender, but just due to something like that. And, you know, and, and people um, uh, do succeed greatly. Right. And I think that we have to prove this with our work. And that will cause a change eventually. Right. Uh, Omer, did you want to add anything? Not much to add, but yeah, the, I think the, the women in, in uh, my field, and I'm sure in other fields, are are proving it wrong so <laughs> the research is amazing so <laughs> right um uh, manohar did you want to add to uh, i just wanted to mention that nishant was in charge of the rf program when we did this diversity effort so i just wanted to point out that he was responsible for it okay uh, sounds good so you uh, had <laughs> sorry <laughs> no no go on <laughs> <laughs> no that's okay, okay. <laughs> um uh, any other oh yes yeah. so let's uh, let's hear from uh, professor hema murthy uh, yeah, Hema, course. welcome to the panel. Sorry, so, Bhavna, I had a huge meeting from the ministry and it went on for a very long time. That's all right. That's all right. So I had dinner and then I completely forgot. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Really? Welcome to the panel. Yeah. We're almost winding up. Yeah. This is a topic that is very, uh, it's a, I mean, it's a pet topic for me being an engineer. Right. And I am actually not really a purely a computer scientist. I'm somebody who masquerades as a computer scientist, perhaps, <laughs> in, in the borderline between electrical and computer sciences, because I work in speech technologies and signals and uh, machine mm -hmm. learning, and whatever. And it is, uh, we have to indulge, as already people have said, I think that affirmative action is mandatory. I am one of those who also believes no harm done in having reservations. I mean, for example, what IIT is doing now in terms of the supernumerary at the undergraduate level, it is doing a lot of good to the undergraduate computer science programs at IIT Madras. Right. We are seeing that because whatever it is, you know, in a class of 60 or 70, when you have about 30 girls, it feels good. Mm -hmm. It really feels good. And they are, I mean, now you can see the assertion that's coming in. Right. I mean, they're not any more quiet in class, which really feels good. Nice. I mean, I uh, last 30 years, this has been something that, you know, there will be six girls in a class of uh, 300 and they won't ask any questions. Now, on the other hand, uh, they're very assertive. And I think nice. that will make a big change. But in the Indian context, we have to do a lot in terms of support systems, which we do not have. Even today, unfortunately, we're very patriarchal societies. I mean, there is something, I think, actually, a lot of men have to do a lot of learning. You know, it's very sad. We have a March 8th program where we invite everybody, but it's only women who come to the programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, diversity happens because everybody believes that liberty is important for everyone. You can't progress by being... Uh, oppressive to the other community mm -hmm. and that's something that needs to be done and in terms of faculty we are still very bad out of about i think almost 700 faculty we have about 56 women faculty barely 10 percent still and most of the faculty are from sciences and uh, humanities in iit Madras. right so this is also something that we need to uh, in fact, one of the things that we are trying is we have what is called a STEM program at IIT Madras with mentorship from women alumni. And we are trying to see if we can, we are trying to recruit women and their spouses together, trying to see if we can solve the two body problem, get both the wife and the husband in the same place. Because many times what we are seeing is the woman has quit her PhD and come to join her husband who has a faculty position. In mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is something that really needs to be done in a very big way. Because if you don't have women role models, how can you expect our undergraduate and postgraduate programs to have women? And of course, I feel not only gender diversity, I, as I had mentioned in my email, 
there is gender fluidity you know i think lgbtq plus whatever it may be i think we have to be uh, affirmative in every respect sure i mean that is my uh, general feeling about all of this that uh, yeah you know, i've been here almost i think 32 years at iit madras and mm -hmm. uh, i've seen it grow from i mean i must tell you when i joined iit madras there wasn't even computer science department did not have a women's toilet right right yeah. When the engineering unit guy said, I didn't, we didn't expect women to join this department. <laughs> right. There we have come a very long way, but still it's, it's progressing, but it's not fast enough. Now, finally, people are beginning to recognize it right. at the faculty level. We have some relaxation for faculties and women faculty means up to 40 years. Okay. Male faculty means 35 mm -hmm. is the age limit. So small things are happening. Right. So I think we need a lot more. Right. I mean, even getting a childcare center, I know that uh, I, in 1992, I was a, I struggled to get a childcare center on campus. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is something that needs to be done. Yeah. yeah. Although it's mandatory according to our child labor laws that you have to 30 women employed, the institute must provide a crash. Right. 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 Yeah. I can never forget the director at that time said, I asked my wife to stay at home to take care of her kids. Yeah. Right, right. No, yeah. This is where, and from there we have come a long way. Yeah. But it's, I think, still just not uh, sufficient. And having, you know, things like this Grace Hopper and all makes a lot of difference. Right. Uh, programs where women come together and, you know, you see a lot of assertion that is there. Right. And I don't know whether this is necessary, but I've seen this uh, Periyar Maniammal College of Technology for Women. It was an amazing school, okay only women and they were all so assertive and then they rescheduled their classes to work in the industry and things like that. So I don't know, sometimes I wonder, does it make a difference to have uh, separate schools for women? I don't know. Right. And right. Is something, because I've seen it in girls colleges, in Stella Maris we go to and then you find the girls are all very assertive. You right. Uh, so I don't know, but I don't like it. but. Uh, Will it make a difference? I don't know. Yeah, it's an, yeah. That, uh, need to be done surely for women and and flexible timings you have to give for right. women in general. Right. Now, fortunately, with the pandemic, that is. Uh, yeah, that may be one of the positive thing. consequences of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the positive. It's really been very positive that way that you know. Yeah. No childcare to drop your kid at somewhere and come back and things like that. Right. But at the same time, many women have also lost their jobs. Right, right, for certain. Yeah. But at the same time, maybe something like this, and many companies are thinking that even after the pandemic is over, they are not going to get them back to right. regular uh, uh, work. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry yeah. for coming in so late. That's okay. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, um, if there are no other questions, I will hand it back to Chaya for closing. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. Um, okay. So thank you, everybody. Uh, this has been a very enlightening session. I would like to thank our uh, panelists for today for graciously accepting our invitation, for being generous with their time and for the thought provoking discussion. Uh, thank you, Tal. Thank you, Manohar. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thanks to all the attendees uh, for staying on despite it being late in the day and for the interesting mm -hmm. questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Hema, for uh, sharing your thoughts on this. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you for the organizers. Thank yes, thank you very thank much. Thank you yes. very much. Thank, thank, you. Bye -bye. thank you to all the panelists. And again, open invitation to visit ISC and we'll make up for the lunch and dinner. <laughs> Okay. That was me. Delighted. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, look forward to seeing you all in person on campus once the pandemic yes. settles. Definitely. Thank, you. thank yeah. you so much. Bye. Yeah, Bye. thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.